Mm, that's drunk. When the subject of longtime developer and publisher Koei gets brought up, the first thought for a lot of people is, oh, those are the folks that made really slow and complicated strategy games with cover art that looked like it was pulled from a museum. I can remember going to Toys R Us way back when they carried so many games that instead of displaying the boxes, they had these little flyers you had to take and bring to the counter. So if you were interested in a game, all you had to go by was the cover art. And when I saw something like Wall of Fire with a price tag of something like $70, I remember thinking, this has to be an all-time great game. So let's take a look and see if I was right. Spoiler alert, I was not, at least not for the first two romance games, but only because great isn't the right word to use. I guess words like adequate or competent would be more accurate, or milquetoast phrases like suitable for the right audience. Now, Romance of the Three Kingdoms is Koei's flagship franchise. The series continues on today, with Romance of the Three Kingdoms 14 being released on Switch, PS4, and Windows back in 2020. The Super Nintendo received three ports from this series for the second, third, and fourth games, so let's start with the second game, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 2, originally made for PC systems in Japan back in 1989, before getting ports to the NES, Sega Genesis, and Super Nintendo, the latter getting released in May 1992, making this the very first Koei game to be localized for the Super Nintendo. The story follows China from the chaos that came about from the end of the Han Dynasty in 189 AD up until its return to imperialism about 30 years later. And for those unfamiliar, the source material the game is pulling from is the titular novel from the 14th century. You start up the game and you get a list of six scenarios to complete. You pick one, and just like every other Koei War strategy game, you get dumped onto a gigantic map with at least three dozen territories. From this perspective, Romance 2 isn't dissimilar from stuff like Nobunaga's Ambition or Genghis Khan 2. You still pick generals to lead the provinces you control, with each general having varying stats for things like intelligence, charm, and military aptitude. You have to win over the people by giving them enough food, you have to recruit soldiers to help you out, and you have to unite every territory on the map to complete the game, all while navigating world events like floods, typhoons, epidemics, rebellions, and uprisings. So, what makes Romance of the Three Kingdoms 2 different? To be honest, not that much. Remember, this is the first Koei port on the SNES, so it's comparatively basic. I'm sure if you were into games like this at the time when this was first released, it was probably pretty exciting. But playing it now with the benefit of having all the other Koei games at your disposal, this game feels like a relic. That's not to say it's bad. The user interface is pretty well laid out, complete with drop-down menus, and as usual, the manual is very helpful. Although in this case, it's a mere 40 pages instead of the usual 70-page behemoth later games received. Combat has you creating different unit types to deal with the bad weather and rough terrain, and you really have to be on your toes in this one. If you're caught off guard and another territory challenges you to a battle and you're not ready, you can refuse the challenge, but your troops will lose faith in you and their loyalty stat will plummet. That is just one small example of the kind of management this game requires, and that's while trying to juggle your political dealings with your neighboring territories and making sure people don't show up at your doorstep with pitchforks and torches. The thing is though, while Romance 2 is still a perfectly decent playthrough today if you're into this sort of thing, it's just kind of dull, especially when you already know these games get more interesting and faster paced. Starting with the next game in the series, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 3 Dragon of Destiny. Again, originally made for PC before receiving a Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo port in December 1993. And fun fact, this is the only Super Nintendo game to have an official full Chinese translation. By this time, Koei had gotten their feet wet with home console ports. They'd cranked out solid titles like Gemfire, Uncharted Waters, and Aerobiz, so Dragon of Destiny provides a better player experience with a slightly faster pace and a much clearer idea of what you're supposed to do to succeed and how to go about doing it. The menus and layout here are similar to another Koei game that was released a little while later, Liberty or Death, so if you've played that, then you'll feel comfortable with this one. Again, the story centers around the Three Kingdoms era of 2nd century China, featuring six scenarios from that time that you'll need to complete to unite all 46 cities. When it comes to the gameplay, the best way I can describe it is, it's Romance 2, but way, way better. Especially when it comes to combat. For one thing, there's isometric battlefields with rivers, forests, castles, and ramparts, and there's a much better balance when it comes to governing your offensive and defensive strength. In all, there's 22 different battlefields on four different types of land, and that alone makes this a 
a massive improvement over Romance 2. The combat itself is simplified too. You just press L or R to bring up your battle display to see the time, weather, and wind direction. It's easy to move around and set up ambushes. The menu is mostly straightforward, at least for a Koei game. And hey, there is always the manual to consult if you're confused. There's duels between commanders, more unit types to manage, slightly more nuanced ways to politic your way into earning allies, and hey, if you don't want to deal with any of that, you have the option to delegate the strategy to the computer. There's lots of other stuff here too, like spying on enemies and starting rumors to stir up bad vibes, or sending gifts to neighboring territories to win their favor, but none of that is unique to this game. You can find that in most of the other Koei historical sim titles. The big impression I get from Dragon of Destiny is that it was made almost to function as a remake of Romance 2. It's more or less the same game, just with better balancing, more options, and more things to manage. So yeah, if Koei strategy games tickle your fancy, I definitely recommend Dragon of Destiny over Romance 2 10 times out of 10. But if you're looking for the best game of the series on the Super Nintendo, then you'll want to play... Romance of the Three Kingdoms 4, Wall of Fire, released for the Super Nintendo in July 1995, originally made for PC-98, but it also got ports for PlayStation, Saturn, 32X, 3DO, and Windows. Koei decided one more time to go back to 189 AD when Dan Zhuo seizes control of Luo Yang, and you've more or less got the same six scenarios here, but the big difference this game has is evident immediately. Wall of Fire looks, sounds, and feels like it was made strictly for the Super Nintendo. That's one hang-up I've long had with certain Koei games. It always feels like you're playing a PC game that's been semi-awkwardly shoehorned into a home console. I don't get that feeling at all with Wall of Fire. The graphics and sound here give this game an extra dimension that's missing from other Koei titles. That's really important in games like this, because all the stats and numbers and options and bone-dry tactical stuff suddenly appears to be a lot more interesting since the visuals and music are so immersive. Suddenly I don't mind the slower pace of tactical games like this when there's such nice music to chill out to. Alright, since Wall of Fire is the best of the bunch, let's walk through how this game works. First, you're asked to select a ruler. There's a list of 18 here to choose from, and there's even three slots available to create your own custom ruler, which is pretty cool. After you picked a ruler, select the Enter button up top, and select Never on this option, otherwise you'll be stuck watching every single battle between every territory on the map, which makes the game 100 times longer than it needs to be. Then you're dumped onto this screen, and here's where most people are like, uh, I don't know what to do. Well, the goal here is to make your city as productive as possible, so they can support your army. So first, you'll want to find stable sources of gold and provisions. Go to the city option on the menu, select a city, and you've got four resources here. Investing in farmland will give you food to provide your citizens, dam protects your city from floods, economy increases the city's economic value, and technology investments build the latest weapons and armor. Since we're just starting here, we're going to need to feed our people, so let's invest in farming. Eventually, you can get to the point where you can sell food for money, and then use that money to recruit and train your army. In the meantime though, as your economy and army builds, you can mess with the territories and cities around you by plotting and scheming like Snidely Whiplash. You can hide an officer in enemy territory where he'll report back secret useful information. You can bribe enemy officers, persuade an enemy governor to rebel against their ruler, spread gossip about other rulers, like Santa's mom wears combat boots or something. Basically, you're just trying to collect as much information about your enemies as you can by hook or by crook. What I really like is that all these options can easily backfire if you're not careful, like your undercover spy turning on you entirely if his loyalty rating goes down even a tiny bit. And hey, if nothing else works, you can just send arsonists over to set stuff on fire. Like every other game of its kind, Wall of Fire is a turn-based game where you can only do so much per turn, and sometimes there's turns where there's really nothing to do, so you might as well just skip ahead to the next month. The game has you meet with your officers every January where they give you advice on what they'd like done. If you can't decide on what to do, you can consult the advice where five officers give you an opinion. Again, you're managing egos and loyalty here. If you reject someone's advice, be prepared for them to pout for a while, so throw them some extra gold so they don't leave your army entirely. 
Eventually, you'll want to start invading other cities, where you'll have to defeat them in the field, then by a castle battle, shown here, then a final battle, which is either through another field battle or by a duel, where you can duel one-on-one, -on -one, three on three, or five on five, and I like that much better than the regular one-on-one -on -one duels. Really, combat is all about preparation. You plot and scheme to find out as much as you can about the city you want to invade. You start training the most effective kind of units, which you'll pick based on what your opponent has. You'll set up any potential reinforcements from allies if needed. And the more you play, the more tricks you'll learn along the way. The only real flaw in Wall of Fire, and in all of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms games on SNES for that matter, it isn't really a flaw at all. It's just that Wall of Fire in particular is a lot like Nobunaga's ambition Lord of Darkness. And similarly, Romance 2 and 3 are a lot like the first Nobunaga's ambition game. If you didn't know any better, you'd think all those games were all in the same series, or even the same game. I guess it boils down to your preference of time frame and characters. Lord of Darkness takes place during the Sengoku period in the 15th century, so that game has a little more advanced technology, if nothing else. The only real gameplay difference that sticks out for me is that I found the combat in Wall of Fire a bit more engaging. I think the graphics and sound help out with that a lot. Wall of Fire also gets to a level of granular detail that can be kind of overwhelming. The good thing is that it's not really required, but it's there if you want to mess around with designating lowly lieutenant commanders, juggling six different types of officers, each with leadership, power, charm, politic, intelligence, and health stats, in addition to 24 different special talents, ranging from foreign relations to repairing things to talking trash and spreading lies. I think I prefer how Lord of Darkness is laid out, personally. But yeah, to sum all this up, the best Romance of the Three Kingdoms game on the Super Nintendo is Wall of Fire. Romance 2 was probably fine for what it was at the time, but it quickly became outdated as soon as Dragon of Destiny came out, and that game is pretty solid, albeit very similar to games like Nobunaga's Ambition. Wall of Fire, though, stands out as the best of the bunch because it's actually immersive. Once in a while, you actually forget that you're playing such a dry, turn-based tactical game. It certainly helps that the menus are intuitive and as polished as it gets for an old home console game like this. It's usually easy to find stuff. And the combat is certainly an improvement over other games of its ilk, although battles can take a long time, as you might imagine. There's a ton of stuff I didn't even mention in Wall of Fire, like negotiating to release prisoners of war, forming alliances to create joint attacks where you and a computer-controlled ally will help you out. There's just a ton to dive into here. It's just, you know, I recognize these games aren't for everyone. But if turn-based tactical games are your jam, then you'll definitely want to check out Wall of Fire. And that is all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.